Again, welcome to the final installment, the third installment of this school year's Be More Me speaker series panel. We're so excited for you to be here. We're gonna have a panel a discussion of about 45 minutes long. And we also have a really special activity at the end for the students that will come with special prizes. So we're really excited. Make sure you're cute and then you're listening. That's, that's your, um, your tip for the day. Make sure you're listening because that's gonna matter at, at the end. I see my sixth graders showing up big time. Yes, sixth graders, go. Where are the seventh graders? Where are my eighth graders? But welcome to you all. Again, I am your host this morning, Nakia Drummond. I'm going to introduce our student moderator and our panelists. Um, and But before I do, I'm going to pause for a second for a welcome from Dr. Tracy Durant, who is the executive director in the Office of Equity to just set the tone for the day. Welcome, Dr. Durant. Good morning, Nakia. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Um, and I said good evening. I'm already in the evening. It's morning. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Again, I'm Tracy Durant, the executive director here um, in the Office of Equity for Baltimore City Public Schools. I'm so excited to be able to greet you today for your final uh, virtual panel discussion in the Be More Me speaker series. I know that uh, we are all excited to have you here, and I'm excited that so many of you are joining us from classrooms all around our city, a uh, city that I love. Um, since Nakia asked us to represent what schools we're from, I'm going to shout out um, all of the schools that I attended in Baltimore as a native Baltimorean. I went to Aviston Elementary School, Booker T. Washington Middle School, and I am a proud graduate of Western senior high school, the oldest all-girls school in the country. So shout out to Doug. Hey, y'all. Um, so I'm really excited. I know today's speaker series is titled, How is Baltimore Shaping History in This Moment and What's Our Contribution? And I will tell you that the panelists that you have today um, are so fitting to be answering that question because they've made major contributions to our city. And so we are so thankful that you all have given your time to be with us today. Um, at the core of Be More Me is like this belief in our city, in the people in our city, in our equity policy. We say that we believe the answers are in Baltimore. And that means with each and every one of you during your exploration of the units, you talked about dominant and silence narratives. You talked about Baltimore as it relates to the rest of the country. I know there are some people that only see um, the, the, the negative things about our city, but Baltimore is a place of such beauty. When people often ask me if I wanna be anywhere else, if I wanna live anywhere else, there is no place I'd rather be than in Baltimore. There's no place I'd rather be at this point in my life than a part of Baltimore City Public School. So before I turn it over to the moderators, I wanna just thank the whole entire team. So Nakia and NLD Strategic will put this together. Uh, Lisa Ann Kim, who um, works with us and leads and shepherds the Be More Me work. Certainly our panelists, Dr. Letitia DeRaza, Dr. D, uh, Chino, Joni Holyfield, and our student panelists, Isain Abidame. And so um, if that's incorrect, I'd love for you to pronounce it for me when you get started. Um, and then thank you to our student moderator, Malaya Victor. Um, lastly, and most importantly, I wanna thank all of you for your hard work, for your engagement. I know that some of you are really excited today. I was happy to see that no one said they were struggling. Some people don't know, and that's okay. Sometimes I don't know either, it's Monday. Um, you put in a lot of work. I hope that you have enjoyed the experience, that you will continue to grow. And when I really think about who is responsible for our history, it is you, it is each and every one of you. Um, I'm so excited to see what you will do when you are done with your time here at City Schools. And I hope, like many of us on the phone, I mean, on the call today, that you will, you know, see this as an opportunity to stay connected, not just to uh, Baltimore City as a whole, but Baltimore City Schools. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the time, Nakia and team. You all have a great discussion. Thank you, Dr. Durant. And 
And since we are shouting out our city schools, I went to Cherry Hill Elementary, which is Cherry Hill Elementary Middle now, Tapsco Elementary, Yorkwood Elementary, Western, the Western High School. And I rounded out my education here again in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins University. So like Dr. Durant, I am a Baltimore girl through and through and really excited to be here with you all. So I'm gonna welcome our panelists and our student moderator at this time. So first up, I'm gonna welcome and thank our student moderator, Malaya Victor. Malaya is a 12 year old eighth grader at Mount Royal Elementary Middle. She is rounding out her middle school career and about to head into high school where she'll be attending uh, Baltimore Polytechnic Institute as a ninth grader in the fall. Uh, and then I would like to introduce our panelists. Dr. Leticia DeRaza. She is the Baltimore City Commissioner of Health. She is a Hopkins trained, a Johns Hopkins trained pediatrician, and she is doing the work of equity for in healthcare in our city and beyond, I'm sure. I know her work is touching me on Baltimore, but definitely blessed to have her um, doing the work here in Baltimore. Next up, Miss Joni, as you all know her, and I say you all know her because everybody knows Miss Joni. We have heard her name so many times on these panels, and we're so excited to have her here today. She is a West Baltimore native, another Baltimore girl through and through. She founded um, Heart Smiles in 2015 in response to the unrest around Freddie Gray's death, and she is really focused on building youth leaders in Baltimore through entrepreneurship and civic service and all types of other amazing things that Ms. Joni and the youth that she supports are doing. So Ms. Joni, we are so happy that you are able to bring your heart smiles here to us today. Thank you. Next up is the person I call my best friend when I see him out on the scene in Baltimore because Chino truly makes everybody feel like a friend. Um, Chino is also known as <clears throat> the blue bearded foodie throughout Baltimore and beyond known for that beautiful blue beard and uh, an equally colorful personality. Um, Chino brings his energy to every scene. He's co-owner of Pinch Dumpling, which I'm excited to hear about, launched his own boutique marketing firm and, be here, and a Netflix series fresh fried and crispy. So um, uh, his bio says, let's just say he eats, drinks and breathes Baltimore quite literally. And if you've been to any of the great restaurants in Baltimore, you have likely seen Chino there enjoying the food, the people, the culture, all things. <clears throat> Thanks so much for being here, Chino, best friend. Um, and Thank last, you. certainly not least, we have our student panelists. Isain Abdidain, she is a senior at Baltimore Polytechnic Institute where Malaya will be joining in the fall. So Malaya is gonna step in her big shoes um, in the fall and she will be attending University of Maryland College Park to study computer science. Isain was born in Morocco and came to Baltimore at age six. Um, she's a part of, no surprise, a part of Miss Joni's tribe at Heart Smiles and is a leader who's facilitating um, classes for students after school on leadership and entrepreneurship. And she's working to solve food insecurity in Baltimore. So as you all see, we have a powerhouse group of panelists and student moderators today. So I'm gonna jump off of the screen now and let Malaya take it away with a session. And students, you have the opportunity um, on the next slide, there is another Minty code for you to ask questions. So Kelly, if you can go to the next slide, thank you. So students throughout the session, if a question comes to mind for you that you wanna have asked at the, during the Q&A period, you can jump on Minty now and just keep that open throughout the session so that you can start, um, so that you can drop questions in. No guarantee we'll get to all of them, but we will get to as many of them as we can. And um, also just, you know, engage in the chat respectfully, of course, drop thoughts in, comments. If something resonates with you, you can engage in conversation that way as well. So Malaya, the floor is yours and thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Malaya, as uh, y'all heard. Um, I'm 12 
and in the eighth grade. And so we're going to get this Q&A started, starting off with Dr. D. Um, what is your 60 second answer to who are you and what's your story? Oh, wow. That's that's a good question. So I am um, the commissioner of health of Baltimore City, but I'm also a pediatrician. I'm a wife. I'm a mother. I'm a sister. I'm a daughter. Um, you know, my story is that um, I grew up not thinking that I could sit in a role like this. So I grew up knowing I wanted to be a pediatrician, knowing um, I wanted to see patients. Um, but when it came to leadership roles, um, didn't see many who look like me, right? And so didn't didn't grow up believing that I, I could do this. So I, I would like to say that I'm um, my ancestor's wildest dream. Um, true story, my grandmother um, who grew up in the segregated South actually wanted to be a nurse. But because of the time in which she was growing up, she, she wasn't able to do that. She ended up becoming a teacher, which is also a very respectable profession. Um, but I know that that was, that was her dream. And so um, I feel really blessed and privileged to, to live out uh, part of her dream now all these years later. All right, thank you. All right, Miss Well-known Miss Joni, um, what is your 60 second answer to who are you and what's your story? Hey, thank you so much, Valea. Hey, look, I'm not that well known because Dan and don't know who I am. About to find out though. <laughs> but um, if I had to put it in 60 seconds, I would say simply that um, I'm a person who cares deeply about my commitment to uplifting and preparing Baltimore's youth to be um, dynamic and transformational leaders. Um, I come from one of the coldest parts of the city, West Baltimore, shout out um, Rice's Town and Gwen's Falls. Um, and I came up through a unrespected, untraditional route towards success. But um, even though um, I had those trials and tribulations, I've been able to successfully with my amazing team um, build a, a business and a movement that is now being recognized in Baltimore as one of the strongest entities for building up young leaders. So if anybody on this call, if you're interested in being a youth leader, that's where you need to be. Very inspiring. All right, Mr. Chino, what is your 60 second answer to who are you and what's your story? <laughs> Hello, how's everyone doing? I hope that my camera comes up. I'm not sure if it's showing, um, but I am a charismatic food personality from Baltimore City. I'm an army brat, so unlike everyone's story, my story kind of bounced around the world. I was born in Germany, but every single person in my family has been baptized in Sandtown Winchester Projects on Gilmore and Baker at St. Gregory the Great Church. Um, and it's a church that kind of instilled all of the goals that I wanted to chase in life. Um, and it made me kind of realize that Baltimore's dreams were a lot bigger than the blocks that we see. Um, so yeah, that's who I am. All right, and last but never least, uh, Sane, uh, what is your 60 second answer to who are you and what's your story? Hey everybody, uh, my name is Isane. Uh, so I was born in Morocco and I came here when I was six years old. Um, I grew up mostly in Southeast Baltimore. Uh, I go to Poly now, about to graduate, about to go off to UMD um, to study computer science. I can't wait to see you there, Malaya. But I'm a youth leader with Heart Smiles. Uh, I'm a youth facilitator, so I go in um, high schools and I teach leadership and entrepreneurship skills, basically stuff that we don't really normally learn in class, like, you know, we're taught all these things, education is great, but these are things that we really need to learn, like to take on to the real world. Um, I'm also a part of the youth food insecurity team, something I'm really passionate about, um, but we work together to solve youth food insecurity. So that's a little bit about me. And that makes a really big difference because it's not that many youth leaders. Um, most people that, like most people that kids look up to now are like mostly adults. And not every adult can be a leader like every kid. So when it's children and kids that can really help other students, it really helps. All right, next question. How do you hope your life and work will be for you beyond, sorry. How do you hope your life and work will live for you for beyond Baltimore? Uh, Dr. Deacon Um, That's another really good question. Uh, so, I mean, I think that when I, when I consider my work, right, so obviously my work is certainly in the context of Baltimore and, and working towards 
um, health equity, health equity and addressing disparities here in Baltimore City. But I also think of my work at home as a wife and mother, right? And so it's important to have a five-year-old that that my son also realized your life in some ways is not your own. Like you you have this life, but it is your responsibility to give back. Um, it's your responsibility to recognize um, and use your scope of influence and your scope of impact to make the world around you better, right? And so, you know, obviously that can be in Baltimore, that can be in many places, but but certainly starting starting here at home. So um, I hope that, you know, that that legacy lives on through through my son. And that could be just like um, your grandmother, how she wanted to be a pediatrician. Um, that could really pass on through the generations. All right, Ms. Joni, how do, you, how do you hope your life and work will live beyond you for Baltimore? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's, it's so important. And every time I think about this, like I always go back to the same thing, which is I want my work and my life, and it's going to sound crazy, yeah. but I want it to eventually be like null and void. What I pray for is that Heart Smiles comes into a position where like the heartbeats who are touched and who um, come through Heart Smiles are able to be in positions of power so that they can permanently dismantle this system of poverty that so many um, black and brown young people find themselves born into. Like, I want people to be able to say like, thank God we don't need a Heart Smiles. Thank God we don't need a Miss Joni because now, you don't have to be born into a system that just wants to see you fail and put you in a community where it's hard to like thrive. Yeah. Um, Tina, uh, how do you hope your life and work will live beyond, beyond you for Bonnie? Yeah, You're still muted. There we go. There we go. There we go. Mine's going to be a little bit long winded. I grew up, unlike everyone, I didn't grow up going to all the city schools, but I did grow up catching the 15 to Woodlawn High School. And that's where I graduated from, from Edmiston Avenue, all the way to Woodlawn every single day and making making a way for myself of finding a dream that looked like me to where I am now. is kind of my plan. My plan is to make make to live an example that you can continually fail that you can continually change dreams that you continue you can continually shift career paths and still and still succeed i would i i hope that the work that i'm doing with i started a nonprofit called the baltimore restaurant relief fund that came to aid for individuals who own small businesses or worked inside of the restaurant industry that didn't couldn't find funding or couldn't find help utilizing our nonprofit to help individuals in need to to either motivate them to branch out and reach out into the restaurant field, or just to live an example that, just to be an exa a shining example that you can be a colorful individual, you can draw outside of the lines, you can color outside of the box, and be a be a prominent a prominent feature in your society, and continually build up your community if you so choose and if you continue to work hard at it. And just being that prime example is kind of what I what I hope to leave behind. All right, and Isain, uh, how do you hope your life and work will live beyond you for Baltimore? Um, so I'm really like right now, really passionate about, like you said, being a youth leader, like getting other youth to to see. Because when I'm facilitating, a lot of people they didn't know that I was a youth as well. But when they found out, I feel like they got more engaged with with the lessons that we taught. And I'm all about breaking like generational curses and stuff, like coming from where I've come from and the family that I've had, like a lot of times, like I see like hurt people, hurt people. And I just don't want to keep that cycle going. That's something that I want to stop and, you know, moving forward. I want to do big things and come back to Baltimore and help out in any way I can. And now I'm not going to lie before Heart Smiles, like I wasn't as passionate about the community as I am now. And one thing that I live by now is it shouldn't have to happen to you for it to matter to you because once you really start seeing all the stuff that goes on in our city, like it could easily be you or somebody that you know. And I just wanna, it's, it, we gotta start somewhere. So starting with me, getting other youth involved is like my main priority and main focus. 
And like I said before, that's really important because all adults can't encourage children, but children can encourage children. All right, this next question is specifically for Dr. D. How are you taking the negative lessons from our history and creating something better for the future? Well, I think as tough as it sometimes can be to go back to the negative lessons um, and, and everything that's happened in the past, it has real consequences, right? And so in Baltimore City, um, in particular, there was a practice called um, redlining that essentially discriminated against um, minorities, um, black and brown folks back in the 30s and 40s and didn't allow them to purchase um, homes in certain neighborhoods. And as such, we still see today, almost 90 years later, where Baltimore is a very hyper segregated city um, in areas that are that are typically dominated by black and brown folks, there's less access to health care, um, less access to grocery stores, um, challenges with transportation and less opportunity overall. And so I think we have to understand the history if we wanna think about changing current systems. Um, and so a big part of, of my role and what I get to do is, is one, implement programs today that help to address those um, inequities and disparities um, and, and also inform policies that can lead to broader systemic change. So when I think about programs, um, one program that I'll highlight is um, something we call our value ambassadors work. And so um, we've hired individuals in the community to support certain populations that were um, either more impacted by COVID or um, had less access to care. Um, and one of those groups is our young people and we've hired youth ambassadors. So um, those individuals can talk to other youth. I think Malaya said it throughout that even if an adult can't encourage or inspire oftentimes we know that peers can. Um, so we've hired those youth to, to really help with talking about the importance of vaccination amongst this group. Um, from a policy level, uh, it's working with our local lawmakers, our city council, um, to think about what's called a health and all policies approach. And so as bills are coming forth to the city council, how do we make sure that we're considering the long-term impact on health? Right? How do we make sure that if we're thinking about building a road here, it doesn't further isolate or marginalize a particular population? So that history, though it can be really hard to, to read about and learn about, is so critical to understand as we think about what to do uh, in the future. Also, how do you stay encouraged when things seem impossible to change? Yeah, you know, I think that I, I, I try to step back and look at the, the good work we've been able to do. Um, so I've been in this role now for three years. Um, so the pandemic started right at my one year anniversary. And I think the day to day can be very hard and it can feel like nothing's changing. Um, but when I step back and I see, well, we vaccinated this number of people across the city, or we made sure that you know, this group had access to at-home tests, right? Uh, we made sure that city schools got access to at-home tests for students and for staff. Um, I try to be encouraged by those things. Um, to, to just know that we, we are making a difference. We're chipping away at it um, little by little. I remember it was around sixth grade and we were going over vocabulary and I learned the words pessimistic and optimistic. And like my mom, she used to be like, oh my goodness, I'm so tired to sign it there. I just be like, mom, stop being so pessimistic. Just think about it the good ways. Be optimistic instead. Because optimism, it can really change the whole world. All right, Miss John, Miss Young. Um, what's your story of the name Heart Smash? Oh, the name. So my sister hated the first thing that I came up with. The first thing that I came up with was uh, the family that stays together. Like that was the name. And my sister was like, like that sounds like a Tyler Perry movie. Like you could do better than that. And I was like, you know what? You right. So I thought about what impact do I want to create? Like, what do I want the end result to be? And I'm like, you know what? For the young people that I work with, I want their hearts to smile. Like, I literally want them to have this feeling like, wow, like the things that I'm doing in life, that the access now that I have to be able to be successful and to do things that I want to do. Like when I look at it, it literally makes my heart smile. So it just came out like, all right, heart smiles. And then when I went back to her, she was like, yeah, that's the one. So I'm like, all right. 
And from what I heard from Camry and uh, Sane, um, it sounds like you didn't make a lot of hearts smile. <laughs> well, we doing our best. I mean, it's it's really not me. I know people like to give me the credit because like I'm the one that started it, but like, no, it's really not me. It's the wonderful and amazing heartbeats that we have who work every single day to welcome new heartbeats into our family and the amazing team that I have that like give their all to make sure that every young person that worked with us got what they need. Also, what led you on this path to create and build heart smiles? And what's the biggest surprise or unexpected gift you've gotten from it so far? It's a great question, Malaya. Um, the Freddie Gray riots. Before the Freddie Gray riots, I wasn't thinking about Baltimore. I wasn't thinking about community. I wasn't thinking about young people. None of that. Like I was actually living my best life in corporate America, but then the riots broke out. And for me, just seeing how the young people reacted, like they burning down their own communities and burning down like their own situation. And I'm just getting upset. Like, why isn't anybody telling them that that's not how you create change and that all you're doing is making your own community worse for generations to come. So for me, I decided to be the person that, um, that I thought was needed in that moment. And because when I was that age, like I used to be ashamed to tell people that I stopped going to school in the ninth grade because I didn't have anybody supporting me or telling me that education was the way out of poverty. I just worked my way out. Um, so I, I was just thinking like, wow, if I had somebody like me, like a Miss Joni who really supported me and opened up doors, then I could have been so much further in life. But um, but it was the it was the riots. I retired myself from my six figure job at the time, and you know, with no knowledge of anything, I just said I'm going to do this. And you know, now here we are. the The biggest surprise, the biggest unexpected gift, I, I would say, is being able to connect with Mr. Mike Bloomberg and his team in the authentic way that we've been able to connect. Um, Coming from where I come from, West Baltimore, growing up poor, you don't get to talk to billionaires. Like you don't get to be in meetings and in conversations with people of that stature. So to be able to have people like him, Miss Nanette, Patty Harris, um, Nancy Cutler, and the other people in the Bloomberg family really have real relationships with us and with our heartbeats and genuinely support us. I would have never expected it, never expected it. And I remember my mom and I, we'd be playing sorry or trouble and she'd be, and I'd be getting frustrated because everybody would have more money or they would be ahead of me. And I would just be like, oh my goodness, I, I just suck. And she'd be like, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And so you saying that you didn't finish school and you retired from your job, that might've been rough in the beginning, but from what you built up, it has made a big change in Baltimore. So, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. All right, Chino, the blue bearded foodie, how do you carve out a space for showing and documenting the joys of Baltimore? And how did it? How did you create such a unique lane for yourself? That's an epic question, um, and a hard one, and a hard one to answer. So the internet, as we all know, was, wasn't necessarily created for people of color or creators of color or content creators of color. Um, so when I first started my social media persona, I realized that it was going to take a lot more work, a lot more resource and a lot more money to kind of fund this dream of being an internet personality. Um, I, real, I also realized that a lot of the content and the imagery around our city was just so it people people often take the take take it take the easier path of talking about the negative as opposed to the positive. And I realized that as I gained steam and as I gained momentum and as I gained followership, and now being viewed constantly by over 1.2 million views a month, um, it is it is imperative to me to to share all of the things that I find beautiful about Baltimore. So I used my, my platform to not only grow as a personal brand, blue beard, being loud, being, being very, very um, verbose in my actions. I 
I use that to propel a different narrative, a narrative of what Baltimore looks like to me. So almost every single day, I run five miles every morning. I go around town and I take pictures of the entire city as I see it. And this doesn't look like the corridors that people typically live and love in um, because our city, as we know, stretches far beyond Charles Street back and forth and Monument back and forth. It's a lot, it's a lot wider and a lot more colorful and there's so much more to explore. So I just utilize um, all of my social media platforms to share that narrative and share that conversation. And it ends me up into spaces like these where I get to further um, emphasize the beauty of the city. And how do I create, how did I create such a unique lane for myself? Well, honestly, it was, it, it all was by happenstance. I went to the University of Maryland Eastern Shore for fashion, mer fashion merchandising. Um, and I thought that I was going to be a fashion designer of some sort. I, we all have those million dollar dreams. And although still probably real, um, I realized that I had a love for food a passion for cooking with people. And I really enjoyed the way that it built community. Um, and also going back to that, oh, there's not a space for people of color. There's not a space for content creators that look like me. I realized that I was going to have to be a trailblazer in which I was like, how can I set myself apart from everyone else? And that, um, that idea didn't come to me naturally. My godson, I think I was taking care of him one day and we were doing a painting lesson and he put paint on my beard and I went to the bathroom to wipe it off upset. And I said, oh, this could work. And I tried it and I went outside. And of course you could imagine the looks that I received were absolutely foolish. Um, but I realized also that how I wanted to portray myself and what I wanted to look like had nothing to do with everyone else. It had everything to do with how I wanted to feel and how I wanted the world to perceive myself and the places in which I live and reside. So I, I like to be as colorful and as beautiful and as stunning as I think Baltimore is. And if that takes a little bit more work for me, well, boom. And yeah, um, that's one of the reasons why social media is so looked down on because people have all those views and followers and they don't really put encouraging things on there. But when you do have a nice platform, you should put all the positives and all the things that could help instead of the negatives. I totally, I totally agree. I think that sometimes we see people who have these large followers and platforms not utilizing their powers for good, right? Not, you live inside of these communities, you live in Baltimore, that Baltimore is in, is in dire need of people to continually share how beautiful it is, simply because people take time to share how negative things happen. Listen, bad things happen in every major metropolitan city and every city in the world. It is up to us to kind of work and continually strive as a group, as a collective, to change to change that narrative. And everyone's job is different. The doctor, the, uh, Dr. D's position is to, to provide a, 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 an entirely different service. Mine, I utilize social media. So what I'm gonna do is continually create positive, impactful images to make people not only want to eat, not only want to live, but also just want to make their lives here in Baltimore, for sure. All right, thank you. Isain, how did you get involved with addressing food insecurity in Baltimore? What advice would you give to other young people who want to work on citywide issues? Um, so when I got started with it, it was just like a project through Heart Smiles. And the more like I got involved, the more passionate I became about it. Like a lot of times we see like, you know, Monday through Friday, we have food in school and then, you know, what happens after school or what happens on the weekends like a lot of you don't have access to foods and especially in Baltimore you can see like you know a, 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 like a, a mini grocery store is is really far away like a giant could be miles away whereas you have like liquor stores or stores like Popeyes and McDonald's right by you when the stuff that we actually need is far away and as a team, like if you guys please follow Youth Food Insecurity and we have like a project where we like, if anybody needs food here, um, it's like a emergency food pantry and, you know, fill that form out and we can get you guys food, um, food as fast as you need it. Um, advice that I got for the youth, everybody on here, like I see a lot of y'all saying like Baltimore is a bad place, but it has to start with us. Like it has to start with us as youth, like, I know like you guys might be feeling like, oh, well, this doesn't apply to me or, you know, I'm not affected by this, but it could easily be one of us. It could easily be one of your friends or somebody that you care about. And then you're going to be like, oh, well, we need to care now. We need to start trying to make a difference now before any of that happens. And, you know, it has to start with us because 
you know, you might be like, well, what can I do? It's just like, I'm just one person. But the more people you impact, the more people you get involved, like the bigger of a difference you're going to make. It has to start somewhere. Like all the, all the big revolutionary events and stuff that's happening, like it started with one person and then they got more people involved. And I just think as youth that we need to start caring more about these issues because it could easily affect us. And we are the people that are growing into Baltimore. And so for us to be comfortable in our own city, we have to make a change. And for generations to come, it's just every generation, it could just progress every single time. All right, so next we have an open Q&A on our Minty meter. Um, we'll just go to minty.com and the code is Can I ask Chino a question since we're waiting for questions to pour in? Absolutely. <laughs> to be Alma, Alma Cocina Latina. Mm -hmm. It's Alma is next to Penn Station. It's a Venezuelan place. They mm -hmm. did a lot of work with the World Trans Central Kitchen. That's one of the huge reasons why I love them. But not only have they done non nonstop philanthropical work, but their food is top notch. It's the some of the best food that I've ever had in my life. And I've eaten across the world and with some of the best chefs around. Um, my number two, it's brand new. It's brand new to my list. It's called Cook House in Bolton Hill. Okay. Bolton Hill, I don't know if you know where that community is, but mm -hmm. it's this pseudo community on, on North where they're, I don't know what they're, you know what they're doing, but uh, they have a couple restaurants in that neighborhood. Tilted Row is, is a restaurant down the street from it that I also love, but Cook House. And then hands down, you have to try Poppy cuisine. Mm, okay. I have to I have to say it because it is he he revolutionized the way that we eat our crab our crab meat and like no matter what anybody says no matter what it's what he, what they say about price those crab cake egg rolls changed the world the last two years I don't know if I survived the pandemic just <laughs> off of those egg rolls but th those are my those are my top three like go to now if you have any deeper questions you can shoot me a DM and I can slide you some some answers on on like different styles but those are my three for sure i just wanted to get the conversation going while we oh while absolutely we, but, I, but i love those recommendations <laughs> oh and thank you guys for finding us inspiring we find you all inspiring as well all right so this is for all of the pan oh um all right uh this is for all of the panelists we can start with dr d is your job hard or difficult it is um you know but but maybe not for the reasons that you guys would think, right? And so I think one of the things that's hard about my job is it's less the science for me, right? So I'm a pediatrician, I, I studied biology in undergrad, I went to med school. So the science to me um, makes sense, right? It's, it's how do you translate that more generally to the public um, in a way that makes sense to them, but also acknowledges, especially during a time like this, that there's a lot we don't know. And I think uncertainty is very hard for people, understandably, right? And so I think that's the piece of it that can be um, challenging. I think navigating all of the different um, priorities, right? And so again, I'm I'm a physician by background. For me, I can be you know solely focused on the public health and the data, um, but there are many things that that you have to consider when you're in a leadership role um, as it relates to decisions. So um, so maybe for that reason, it can be hard. Um, and then lastly, and I'll, I'll turn the floor over. Um, I'm an introvert by nature, and so I think um, something that was that was hard for me. Um, especially when, when the pandemic started was like the constant, like being on camera and speaking and, and this panel and that panel. Um, so that was actually very hard for me. That was one of the most 
angst-provoking things for me back in March of 2020 <laughs> was that I had to be on camera, um, knew I was going to have to be on camera being that messenger for um, for quite some time. So um, th those are the things I think that, that make the job hard for me. All right, Ms. Joni, is your job hard? I would describe it, Malaya, as heartbreaking. Like it can be very rewarding, but also extremely heartbreaking. I got obituaries this thick from funerals of young people that I've been to. Like I try to go to as many funerals as I possibly can. And it's just heartbreaking to, to see a, a young person's life cut short because this senseless violence is running rampant. And then um, to see young people waste their talent and waste their potential. Like our job isn't to change anybody's minds. Like we don't try to change nobody's mind. You got to already want success and you have to already come to the table wanting to do better. And just like seeing people who don't want it and who are just content living in poverty and in a messed up circumstance when they have a different option, it's just heartbreaking at times. Yeah. All right. Chino, is your job hard? Uh, yeah, it is. Um, I think a lot of people, a lot of people think that it's a super simple job to do a lot of the things that I do. Um, creating the narrative for over 40 different restaurants in Baltimore, smiling and talking to all of the people nonstop um, while dealing with your own life. It's 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 a juggling, it's a juggling act, but I would not change my career as it stands for anything else in the world. It allows me the opportunity to use my voice in a multitude of ways. Um, and that's kind of what would the goal of my life was, is. All right, you saying is your job hard? Um, no, I think it's more inspiring to me than anything. Just like seeing youth and just wanting like them to be better and just like just saying that we're in the same spot in life and just seeing like the the impact and the the possibilities that we have as youth it just it, it inspires me a lot it makes me want to go harder all right um so we're going to start off with dr d again who inspired you the most um, I mentioned my grandmother, I think between my grandmother and my mom, um, you know, because I think my grandmother was an educator because they, they grew up um, both in a time in the segregated South, like they, they really pushed the importance of education um, and that oftentimes education and, and excelling in education can be um, your ticket out, your opportunity to, to do anything. Um, so I would, I would say those are, those are the two that inspired me growing up. All right, Ms. John, Ms. Joni, who inspired you the most? It hands down my heartbeats. Like people like Sane who are on here now and Cam Gotti who's going off in the chat. Like they are so much better than what I could have ever been at their age. And to see the impact that they are making in the city and through just their leadership with other young people, like hands down the most inspiring thing I'll probably ever see in my lifetime. All right, Chino, who inspired you the most? Well, that's a tough, tough act to follow. Um, I, I would have to say I'm, I'm, I'm a part of a family, a, a prominent law family here in Baltimore. My uncle, Alex, um, Judge Alexander Wright, he became the first African-American circuit court judge in Baltimore County ever. And this was in 1990. So to be the first, for him to have spent 20 years trying to become a judge and for him to be placed on the ballot and to not get it and to continually turn to our family and have us um, rally behind him and never give up faith and continually stand behind his dreams and then becoming one of the first African-American judges and then recently having his portrait hung in the court, in the court it kind of inspired me to not give up, even if it takes 20 years, even if it takes 30 years, even if it takes my entire life, his, his story of never giving up will inspire me to keep going on. Persistence is key. Um, Isain, yes. who inspired you the most? Um, I'm gonna just go ahead and say it, Ms. Joni. Like, Ms. Joni has inspired me the most because just seeing another Black female doing what she's done and like her story, I really gotta hear her story. Like, it's just so inspiring and like, you know, she is just like, she didn't have to go out and do all of this. And the fact that she is, and she cares so much about 
Baltimore and the youth as a whole is just like so inspiring to me. And I, and it makes me want to do things like me, it makes me passionate about my community and I want to do things like that. So, and the fact that I'm out here inspiring other youth is just so amazing. And I don't think any of this would be possible. Like I'm so, I will say it again and again, I'm so, so grateful for Heart Smiles because like me before then and me now, it's like the amount of growth I've made is just crazy. And none of that would be possible without it. Like it, it's allowed me to step outside of my comfort zone and just blossom into the person that I am now. And like, it's more growth to come, which is just crazy to me. And it's just like, I'm just so extremely pr proud to be a heartbeat. And it's just amazing. Like I'm really, really, really inspired. All right, all of our panelists, um, can you guys drop what Baltimore City Schools y'all went to in the chat? And then we will move on to our final question. Um, we can start off with Isain. If we created a time capsule, what would you include that would tell students 100 years from now something meaningful about you? Um, if I, like 100 years from now, what I would tell the students? Um. Like I just hopefully a hundred years from now, like more youth is, are involved. Like I just want to tell them like to keep getting more involved, and hopefully by that time, like there's a lot of progress from then until now. So and all of that would have been possible with youth starting now, and you know making an impact now and working together now because we like I said we got to start somewhere. And at that point, like I want I don't want it to just stop like when we're in a good place in Baltimore and the world as a whole. Like I want it to keep going. So. Just keep going, keep pushing for what you're passionate about, what you care for. And, you know, this, just your passion alone is going to make the world a better place. All right, Chino, if you created a time capsule, what would you include that would tell students 100 years from now something meaningful about you? Um, I would include a set of required reading that would include Be More Arts, 11th edition, um, Baltimore Art is a magazine that um, came into existence a few a couple years ago that curates just a wonderful co collection of our art and stories of the artistic people that that edition has a long story about me but also the anti-racist by Kondwani Fidel um, the Freddie Gray book by Devin Allen um, and a, a, just a series of required reading by people our at my age um, I'm 34, so it right now being able to see and read authors that are my age tell stories that are stories that I know and I've saw and I've experienced, um, and that urge urge students and urge people in our community to go forth and 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 continually create, um, giving that making sure that I'm reinstilling the foundation that literacy is key, making sure that we have we are getting the knowledge that we need and hearing it from the people that look and act and sound just like us. That is very important because reading, I've always grew up my own be like Blair, reading is fundamental. Reading is fundamental, reading is fundamental. And so I, I'm more of a math type of kid. So like every once in a while, I'll be like, I need to go read something because with reading, it can help you like throughout your whole life because you're gonna have to read for your whole life. It doesn't matter what job you do. You can be a mechanic, you have to read, a plumber, you have to read. Any job that you do, you have to read. So being able to read is very important. All right, Ms. Joni, if we created a time capsule, who would you include that would tell students 100 years from now something meaningful about you? So Malaya, this is what I would do. We have this very talented artist who's a heartbeat. Her name is Gemma Chester. She's 17. She's going to be a world-renowned artist. Like, that's how good she is. I would have her hand paint a portrait of like all my heartbeats and like me somewhere in the middle with this like very simple caption that says, heartbeats will lead, change and heal the world. And a hundred years from now, like those kids will look at that and they will recognize those heartbeats as prominent people who paved the way for them to be where they are. Like imagine us looking at like a portrait of like Martin Luther King, Harriet Tubman, Malcolm X, like people like that, like that's what it would be a hundred years from now. And they will never forget the name Heartbeats. All right, <laughs> Dr. D, if we created a time capsule, what would, you, what would you include that would tell students 100 years from now something meaningful about you? 
You know what, I'd actually probably, I'm gonna go a completely different route than everyone else. I'd probably include a picture of um, my family um, because they're uh, meaningful to me. And I think I, I do this work for them. I mentioned my son and, and wanting him to pursue whatever his dream is and, and never feel like um, he can't pursue his dream for um, because he's a boy or because he's black or, or whatever the reason that might, might be holding him back. So um, I would include a picture of, of my family. <laughs>